once he arrives in Medina to Munawwara, all of the Muslims begin to accept Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many, of course, they accept Islam at the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this person doesn't really like it too much because he was considered a very special, prominent figure before Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina itself. Now this person, Abu Amir al-Rahib, he was waiting to see if he could seize the opportunity to take out the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and to wipe out Islam. The battle of Badr came, he saw exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did for the Muslims against the disbelievers. He couldn't tolerate this. So while he was still in Medina al Munawwara, he decides to leave after the battle of Badr and he decides to go uh, to Mecca to join the chiefs of the Quraysh to try to persuade them and incite them in going up against the Muslims. So there was the battle of Uhud, which this person also takes part in himself. He takes, he plays a role in it. He comes to the Ansar, the helpers of the Prophet ﷺ from Medina to Munawwara who have joined Rasul ﷺ in the battle of Uhud and he tries to get them to leave and flee the Prophet's side in the battle of Uhud. But of course, they were the companions of Rasul ﷺ. They were real, genuine people. These were not the Munafiks, these were the Sahaba. They said, there's no way, you are an enemy of Allah, you are a hypocrite, we won't listen to you. And they decided to desert him. When he saw this, he said, it seems like the people have changed after, from the time that I had come to Medina, or they had arrived in Medina through Munawwara. Anyhow, from the time that he had come, versus the time now, where they have joined the Prophet ﷺ. So, in Uhud, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the good end is always for those who are pious and righteous. We know what happens in the battle of Uhud. After this, this person had decided that he would go and join Heraclius and he would request Heraclius to prepare an army to go with him to wipe out Islam. Heraclius did make him the promise that he would assist him and he would aid him in doing so. However, until that time was to come and they were going to seize the perfect opportunity, he had requested that he just stay in Syria with Heraclius. So he's there in Syria. But while he's there, he continues to prepare enemies, hypocrites, against the Prophet ﷺ in tormenting or in doing anything they can to wipe out Islam. Though he's living in Syria, but he works with people that are in Medina al Munawwara, the Munafiqun, the hypocrites. And he requests them to build a masjid. And this masjid that they build will be kind of like a sanctuary in a place for these munafiqs to decide to come together, to make decisions, to consult, to advise one another on how they are going to wipe out Islam. This is what they built a masjid for. And this masjid is known as Masjid Dira. Allah speaks about this masjid in the Holy Quran in the 11th part as well. So Masjid Dira was built by these people. And after it was built, they decided that if anybody asks, if the Prophet wants to know, we'll tell them it's a masjid that we've designed, we've created, or we've built for those who are weak and for those who, need, who have special needs. This is what they thought they could do. So when the Prophet ﷺ is on his journey with the believers to Tabuk, for the expedition of Tabuk, during this time, these people come to him, those who had built Masjid Dirar. Okay, they came to the Prophet and requested him if he could perform a couple units of prayer, a few rakahs of salah inside of the masjid to bless that masjid. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented the Prophet and Rasul gave them an excuse. He said, right now we're busy with tabuk. Perhaps when I come back, inshallah, we'll think about it. So the Prophet goes, we know what happens in Tabuk, and then he returns. And as he was returning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals verses, again in the 11th part of the Holy Quran, praising Masjid Quba and uh, condoning this masjid that these people have built. So masjid, it was actually pretty close to Masjid Quba, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises. This is the first masjid in Islam. Allah praises Masjid Quba in the Holy Quran. And we know the reward for performing Salat in Masjid Quba is like per performing an entire Umrah. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said. So Allah praises Masjid Quba and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condones this masjid because this wasn't a masjid. This didn't serve the purpose of a masjid. It wasn't a place where people would come to perform their salah, get 
closer to Allah, read the book of Allah and remember Him. No, this is a place that they wanted to come together to plan and they wanted to conspire to annihilate the nur of Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals these verses as the Prophet is returning from Tabuk and as a result of this, Rasul requests, he orders rather, his companions to raise that masjid to the ground. That masjid is then demolished, the end. Allah speaks about that in the Holy Quran as well. Now when the Prophet returned, all these people, the munafiqs, they came one by one, they're presenting their excuses to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as to why they didn't participate. And the Prophet knows that these are the hypocrites. And so he accepts their excuse, next, ex next, next. But then there was three individuals we told you about yesterday. Murara bin Rabia, Ka'b ibn Malik, and Hilal bin Umayyah. All three from the Ansar of Medina, radiallahu anhu majma'in. Two of them were a little more older, they were a little more weak. But then one, Ka'b ibn Malik, anhu, he was young, he was in his youth, he was in his prime, he had strength, he had wealth, he had everything. So their story goes like this. Ka'b ibn Malik anhu, narrates it. I wish that you actually go into the books of Ahadith. You find it there. It's in Bukhari, it's in Muslim. You can find it in Riyadhul Salihin. Matter of fact, you can f find it in Fadail A'mal as well. But the story goes somewhat like this for those of us who may have not heard it until now. And I'm not going to say the entire story in detail from whatever I remember from the story. So Allah speaks about these three individuals. I mean, they're so fortunate. And how Allah speaks about them too is just amazing. Ka'b ibn Malik is the one narrating the story. He says when the Prophet ﷺ came, everybody would go to him and he, they would present their excuses to him. We told you about the prelude to this yesterday, how it was so difficult for the Muslims, how there was poverty, how there was drought, how there was like thirst. They were dying of thirst. They literally, they say that we thought that our necks were going to, or our heads were going to be severed and, you know, fall off of our necks as a result of the thirst that we had encountered during this expedition. We would share a date amongst two people. One person would eat the date, and then he would suck the juice from the pit of the date, and then he would share this pit with his fellow comrade. This, these were the dire conditions of the companions during the time of Tabuk. So it was very difficult. Anyhow, when Rasul Sallallahu reached there, when he comes to Tabuk, he asked, what happened? Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? So one person said, oh, you know, unfortunately he's become proud or arrogant, using different words. Mu'ad bin Jabal said, no, we don't know anything but good about him. All right, we'll see whatever happens. There were so many people who had participated, it wasn't possible for them to like literally take a roll call and keep all the names in a list. So when they went, Ka'b ibn Malik must have been a special one. They realized that he wasn't there. The Prophet Wasallam asked about him. Ultimately, they returned. We told you what happened. There was no fighting, but of course, there was a lot of peace treaties that were signed, etc. And of course, the chiefs and leaders of the other tribes were also intimidated. They were. They saw that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala indeed, you know, put into their hearts an awe-inspiring fear for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi and the Muslims. When they come back, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is asking, "Okay, everybody's presenting their excuses." When Ka'b ibn Malik radiAllahu anhu comes. The Prophet ﷺ made a smile, but not the smile of a happy person. One narration, he turns away. And in one narration, he smiles, but it's an angry smile, if you can understand what I mean. So the Prophet ﷺ asks him, مَا خَلَّفَكْ What kept you behind? أَلَمْ تَكُنْ Wasn't this the time when didn't you have for yourself something to ride on? And Ka'b ibn Malik himself says, I was never as wealthy in my life as I was then. I didn't participate in Badr, no doubt, but I participated in every other campaign. I was there when we, the pledge of Aqaba was made, and I wouldn't take, I wouldn't exchange that for anything in my life. Not even Badr, though Badr was most common, it was more common amongst the Arabs, but he says, I was there for Aqaba, I was there on so many expeditions. And I know very well now, I'm not speaking to any man of this world, any king or anybody else. I'm speaking to the Prophet of Allah. So if I present to him an excuse by lying, I might be able to get away with it now to earn his pleasure. But verily indeed, very shortly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire and reveal unto him exactly what the truth is, and then I'll be in trouble. And then on the other hand, if I do speak the truth now, I may incur the displeasure of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But ultimately Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will inform the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I'm not a munafiq. So after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, what, keeps him, what kept you back, O Ka'ab, O Ka'ab ibn Malik? 
He says, listen, O Prophet of Allah, you know that I am not a munafiq. I am not a hypocrite. And I have no excuse. Every day I intended to come out, I intended to come out, I intended to come out to make the preparations, to get my provisions ready, to prepare my, my conveyance, my camels. I had two at the time. Every day I kept telling myself, I'm going to do it. The Muslims are doing it. The Prophet's doing it. I'm going to do it. Today I'm going to do it tomorrow. But I just continued to procrastinate, continued to procrastinate. And we know in English they say, procrastination leads to disaster. If you want to know what that means, we can ask inshallah in Jannah, Ka'ab ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, what's about to happen next? So Ka'ab ibn Malik says, eventually the Prophet left. The Muslims were gone. And I was still there. I was in Medina and I'd look around and I'd only see those who were either hypocrites or they were excused because they were so weak, they were so old, they were so, you know, they, had, they, 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 they qualified not to go. So I was thinking to myself, I'm young, I'm wealthy, I've got it all, I'm in the prime. Oh my, why didn't I go? So I said, tomorrow I'm going to go on. So next day I'm going to join him. But it didn't happen. And I continued to procrastinate, continued to delay like this until they returned. Uh-oh. So I told the Prophet ﷺ, now that he's returned, I told him, listen, I'm not a munafiq. I'm definitely not a munafiq. If I want, I can lie to you and I can get away with it. Allah will ultimately tell you the truth. And if not, then you know, I'm, if, if, I'm, I, I, don't, I tell you the truth, I'm going to incur your displeasure. So the Prophet ﷺ then said to those that were sitting that this man has spoken the truth. Now we will wait until Allah decides his matter. Allah will make the decision regarding his not taking part, not being part, not joining, participating in the battle of Tabuk. So what is the verdict? Rasul ﷺ tells everyone, his family and everyone, his friends and everybody, that they are to boycott Ka'ab ibn Malik. Nobody is allowed to talk to Ka'ab ibn Malik, period, for no reason whatsoever. And now I'm thinking, wow, Ka'ab ibn Malik narrates. I asked about the other two, if there was anybody else that stayed behind. They said, yeah, there was Murar ibn Rabi and Hilal ibn Mayya. So what about them? Is this what, what happened to them as well? They said, yeah, the same thing. But they were allowed to stay inside of their homes. All they did all day was cry inside of their homes. They were given this permission because they were old. They were, their situation was a little different than Ka'ab's. As for Ka'ab, every single day I would wake up and this was my condition. I wasn't allowed to see any, I mean, I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. Nobody, allowed, nobody was allowed to talk to me. Well, nobody was allowed to talk to me. I'd been boycotted by every single person. One day I decided to go to my best friend's house who was a cousin of mine. Abu Qatada was his name. I jumped the fence or, you know, I got, got inside his property and I made salam with him. Wallahi ma radda alayya salam. This was the most kanat min ahabbin nasi ilayya. Kanat min ahabbin nasi. This was the most beloved individual to me in the world, perhaps, of all the people, my friends. But even him, he didn't reply to my salam. I said, oh my goodness. I said, you know I'm not a munafiq. He didn't say a word. I said, by Allah, you know I'm not a munafiq. He didn't reply. When I said it a third time, he says, Allah and his prophet know best. Oh my, the world, despite its vastness, had become like a narrow pass for me. Oh, it was so difficult. I used to go to the masjid to perform my salah, and nobody would make salam with me. And I used to look at the Prophet wasallam. and the moment he realized I was looking at him, he would look away. And when I stood in my salat, I noticed that he would be looking at me. And I continued in this, in this, in this condition until one day a man came. He was traveling from a different land. From a different land, he came with a letter from the king of Ghassan. And he presents the letter to me from his emissary. And I read the letter, Amma Abad, we see that your master, Muhammad has disowned you, he's abandoned you. Why don't you come to us? You know, your Lord wants that you should live in peace and you should live in happiness as a free man. Something along these lines. Why don't you come to us? We will take care of you. I looked at this and realized that this is just another test. How dare. So I threw it inside of the fire that was burning in the oven and I dealt with it just there and then. 40 days went by like this. After 40 days, a person came, a messenger came from the Prophet ﷺ to tell me that I was to leave my wife. Am I supposed to divorce her? No, no. You don't divorce her. You just don't mingle with her. You stay away. I asked her to go spend the time, the rest of the time until Allah would decree whatever was written for me to go spend this time with her parents. She goes to spend time with her parents. And then Hilal bin Umayyah was also an old man. He wasn't allowed. His wife said, he's got no need to come to me anyways. He's extremely old. He's in such a bad condition. He's been crying and crying by day and by night. Fair enough. 
I continued like this for 50 days. Not one person was allowed to talk to me. And the world had become so alienated. It was so strange. And finally, I was sitting on a hill one day, and I heard, Abshir ya Ka'ab. I heard from a distance, one or two horses were coming in my direction, and another man whose voice reached me before the horses could come to me. They said, glad tidings to you, O Ka'ab. I knew then and there that this was glad tidings that Allah had accepted my repentance. That Rasul had been informed that I was sincere in my repentance. I had spoken the truth and chosen not to speak a lie. And then after this, I fell prostrate in sujood. I made sajda to Allah. And that person who had come to me with the good news that Allah had accepted my, my repentance, I went and I borrowed some clothes, a few garments, and then I took the clothes that I was wearing at the time. And this was a practice, an amazing practice where you might find in some parts of the world today. I took the clothes that I was wearing and I gifted them after wearing the other clothes myself. And then I went and I hastened to the masjid at once. And Rasul was there. And I saw him sitting with the companions. And I'll never forget him for this. Talha bin Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu is the man. He stood up for me. And he greeted me and he embraced me. I will never forget this gesture of his. Rasul sallallahu alayhi then he mentions these words. Abshir ya ka'ab, bi khayri yawmin marra bik, mundhu waladatka ummuk. Oh ka'ab, glad tidings to you. Receive glad tidings. The best thing that you have ever received from the day that your mother has given birth to you. I knew then and there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already made it clear to the Prophet that indeed I, I had repented and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had accepted this repentance of mine. So the story goes on just a little longer. But Rasul was revealed verses in the Holy Quran in this part where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these three that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven them. Now some of the other subjects as well. When Abu Talib was dying, Rasul invited him towards Islam and he told him, Say la ilaha illallah. And we know Abu Talib didn't accept. Instead, he replied to the Prophet, There's actually a few more stanzas and they're just beautiful, but it's just sad to know that somebody who was such a great support for the Prophet during his entire mission until he was alive, Abu Talib, he left this world without Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses also in the 11th part of the Quran to tell the Prophet ﷺ that he was not allowed to seek Allah's forgiveness for any disbeliever after they have left this world. He made every effort to invite him towards Islam as long as he was alive. But now that he has left this world, we don't seek forgiveness from Allah for those who left this world in a state of disbelief in kufr. So these verses also. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam, regarding him and his father, on the day of judgment, Ibrahim alayhi salam will see that his father was in a, is in a state of disbelief in kufr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in the Holy Quran as well. Of course, very, not in detail, because the details for this we find in the authentic traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His father will come to him, Ibrahim alayhi salam, on the day of judgment, and he will tell him that I didn't believe in you when I was in this world, but today I do believe in you. So then Ibrahim alayhi salam will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to disgrace him in regards to his father. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell Ibrahim alayhi salam to look behind him. And when he looks behind, he will see that his father will have been given the shape and form of a hyena and then the hyena will be thrown into the fire of Jahannam. So he won't see his own father per se going to the fire of Jahannam. He will see his father disguised as a hyena. He will see him as a hyena and then the hyena will be thrown into the fire of Jahannam. So Allah speaks about this as well, Ibrahim alayhi salam with his father. And then Allah says, now going back to the story of Ka'b ibn Malik, amazingly, Allah speaks about telling the truth. Speak the truth. Right after Allah speaks about that story, Allah tells us to speak the truth and be amongst those. To, so fear Allah and be amongst those who are truthful. We see what Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu received. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exonerated him from above the heavens. That's what happens when we speak the truth. Yes, we may be disgraced. 
or we may be humiliated, or we might lose a friend, we might lose a transaction, we might not make the greatest profit as a result of speaking the truth. But in the end of the day, if we've received Allah's pleasure, we win. That's what Ka'ab ibn Malik received. Everyone to read the Quran until the day of judgment will read these verses that exonerate Ka'ab ibn Malik and that tell us that Allah was indeed pleased with his repentance and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, uh, talks to us about the believers. The more they enhance, that Allah will continue to enhance the faith of the believers. The more they believe, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase them in their iman. And contrary to this, the disbeliever or the munafiq rather, the more the munafiq disbelieves, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase this person in his doubt or in, his, her, in her doubt. So a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to increase their belief as long as they're believing. But the one who is a munafiq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase them in their doubts. That is perhaps the end of chapter uh, Surah At-Tawbah. Of course, there were other things too that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about because yesterday we cut it a little bit short. For instance, one of the things that just popped into my head right now, in the 10th part of the Holy Quran are the eight different categories of people to whom the zakat may be given. And there's no need to go into this right now, especially during the month of Ramadan. I'm sure we all have our answers to our questions regarding zakat from our imams, our scholars, our muftis, because many of us, alhamdulillah, like to give our zakat during the month of Ramadan. So we should have these answers from the jurists, from the scholars. We should find the answers to all of our questions. Apart from that, Allah speaks about the eight different categories to, of people to whom zakat may be given in that part as well. Now coming back, so once Surah to Tawbah is done, there is Surah to Yunus. Of course, we know Yunus was a prophet of Allah, and the name is taken from a prophet who Allah speaks about, of course, in the chapter of Yunus as well, also in the 11th part of the Holy Quran. So at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about His being the greatest, His being the creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought everything into existence. Allah is the creator. Allah is the one who gives, cre brings creation into being. Allah designs, Allah gives shape to the creation. We learn this from the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we know that He is the most plentiful giver. Allah is the most generous bestower. Allah is the provider. So Allah sustains all of this. Allah speaks about this in the Holy Quran, different verses here too in the 11th part of the Holy Quran. Allah speaks about the abode. I have, inshallah, an intention to speak during our night talks at 11.30 p.m. here, the Eastern Daylight Savings Time, Toronto. So we will speak one night, inshallah, about some of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for those who are the good people, the believers and others. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the punishment that He has prepared for those who disbelieve. So we'll speak about that too. Maybe we could speak about the abode of the disbelievers first, like Shaykh Abdul Nasser Jangda once said, not to leave a sour taste in our mouths. And then we can speak about the abode of the believers. So Allah speaks also about the mushrikeen, the idolaters, those who associate and ascribe partners unto Allah. Allah speaks about them a great deal in the 11th part. So they used to ask the Prophet ﷺ for miracles. Now, Prophets weren't sent into this world to show miracles to the people. Neither was our Prophet ﷺ sent into this world to manifest or to demonstrate a miracle. This is not the mission, this is not the purpose of nubuwa, of prophethood. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did manifest miracles at the hands of the prophets. We know at the time of Musa alayhi salam, magic was the thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Musa alayhi salam with such miracles that just obliterated, just destroyed all of the people's magic. And then we know during the time of Isa alayhi salam, medicine was the thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested such miracles at the hands of Isa alayhi salam, which put all all of their medicine to shame. At the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, poetry was the game. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was blessed with the Holy Quran, which just put every, everyone's poetry to sleep. So they asked Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for miracles, not that they were going to believe. They were shown miracles, numerous miracles Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam demonstrated, Allah manifested at His hands, but these people still refused. And then, these people, the mushrikeen, how on the day of judgment, those that they ascribed and they associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will denounce them. They hold them in very great regard and in esteem and in honor in this world, but they, on the day of judgment, they will be made to lose very, very sorely when those that they worship 
instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will disown them. And also about the mushrikeen. They knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one. Allah tells us, If you ask them who created the heavens, who created the earth, they know it's not these idols that they make with their own hands. They knew that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this answer, this reply in response to the Prophet ﷺ, that it is Allah who created all these things, this was also contradicting that which they believed. Why then would you worship and would you worship an idol which doesn't give you any benefit, doesn't give you any harm, it can't even speak to you, can't even respond to you. Allah speaks about them. Now, Allah speaks about us and how ungrateful we are to Allah. When things are not good, we turn to Allah. Oh Allah, please. Oh Allah, your help. Oh Allah, your help. Oh Allah, your support. Oh Allah, your aid. Oh Allah, your assistance. And when everything is fine, we forget about Him. Allah speaks about how the mushrikeen used to do this as well. Whenever they were stuck, whenever they were in problems, whenever there was trials and tribulations, whenever, whenever there was hardship and difficulty, Oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah. Or when there was a storm on the sea, when they were aboard their ships, Oh Allah, oh Allah. The moment, فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُ مِنَ الْبَرْ The moment they were saved, they were made to rest ashore, they got to the, 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 the shore, they would forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the mushriks used to do with Allah. And unfortunately, this is what many people do today. When things are going very well, they don't even think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't worship, they don't practice as much as we're supposed to. But when things go wrong, that's when everybody starts to resort to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not fair. Last night when I spoke about the virtues and the blessings of making dua, I said, remember Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said this, remember Allah at times of ease, at times of prosperity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember us at times of difficulty and hardship. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Qur'an being a miracle. They want a miracle, so then the Qur'an is the greatest miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam till the end of time. It is a living miracle for everybody. Anybody that dares try, try to challenge the Holy Qur'an will fail miserably. Those that have tried to challenge it in the past, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of them. Those that have tried to challenge it in the modern day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put them to shame. And anybody that tries to challenge it, Try to bring something even one-tenth its size. Wait, one-tenth the size of a chapter. Wait, produce one verse about which nobody will have a doubt. Anybody would be able to memorize and it was, it is pure and it is divine and it is from God and it is from the heavens. There's nothing like it in the world. Take every book in the world today, every single book in the world, every bit of information that has ever been documented or ever, ever been written or authorized or authored. Take it all, throw it inside of the water, get rid of it, delete it for once and for all. What is the only book that remains? The book of Allah. Because miraculously, Allah has blessed the hearts of millions throughout the globe to put it to memory to the T. Literally, the dots, the nuqtas, the fathas, dhammas and kasras, everything in its detail has been memorized. It's the sign, it is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then how the criminals and everybody that does cruelty and everybody that oppresses and everybody that takes with others and how all of this that we see in the world going on right now in different parts of the world, don't forget whether it happens in this world or it happens in the life hereafter, Allah will avenge. Allah will take care of all of the oppressors. There are those that are going through hard times, difficult times in war-torn countries. There are those that are being oppressed unprecedented. It is unparalleled the amount of torture, punishment that is being meted out to many, many innocent lives. Oh, Allah sees all of this. Allah knows all of this. And Allah will either take care of the oppressor in this world, and if not, then most definitely in the life hereafter. Allah reminds us about this in the 11th part as well. And that on the day of judgment, resurrection is real. Resurrection, that we will be brought back to life on that day. It is haq and it's going to happen. And the mushriks, the idolaters, they used to tell the Prophet if it is real, why don't you bring it? But he didn't know when it was going to happen. And Allah has got his fixed time for it. So whenever Allah wants it to happen, it is going to happen. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the end of the chapter speaks about his friends known as the awliya and who they are, a few of their qualities. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the story of Nuh alayhi salam, which we've already mentioned a little bit about. And then the story of Musa alayhi salam, that part of the story of Musa alayhi salam, which we've mentioned until now, we reached the signs. So after they refused to accept the signs, what happened? The locust came, the flood, the flood, and everything else that came. After this, they were going to be saved. And one, Ibn Jarir rahimahullah, or Ibn Kathir rahimahullah has mentioned it for sure, but maybe Ibn Jarir as well. 600,000 of the Bani Israel, they leave Egypt with Musa alayhi salam. After they cross the Red Sea, they make it over to the other side. They are intact, they are perfectly fine. Allah ordered Musa alayhi salam to strike his staff and the sea would part into 12 different ways, 12 different paths for 12 different tribes. And they make it across, everything is perfectly fine. While they look back, they see Fir'aun. When Fir'aun is there, he tells his people. And he was really upset the fact that Musa alayhi salam and the Bani Israel with him, they managed to go with the excuse that they were going to join a feast or something. They managed to seek, they, they were given the permission. When they managed to leave, Fir'aun is enraged. Fir'aun is extremely, extremely upset that they managed to get away. So he prepares all of his armies. He, get, he prepares a massive army. And every single big man, every person of authority and power, all of the elite from Fir'aun's people, they were all a part of this army. They set out in the morning to try to catch up with them. They got there. When they get to the sea, Fir'aun's like, watch what I'm able to do. He thought the water, of course, which had already parted from Musa salam, was going to part for him as well. When they all went inside, it was parted when they went inside. But the moment they came inside, they were all destroyed and drowned. Every single one of them was finished there and then. Now the story goes on, but this is that part of the story. We will continue when we get there. This is that part of the story until where Allah speaks about in the 11th part. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Yunus alayhi salam. The special thing about Yunus alayhi salam's people was that they were warned about a punishment that was going to come to them. And then when they realized that the punishment was going to come, they were given respite for three days and Yunus alayhi salam had left them. They realized that it's not a joke. So they all came out. The men came out, the women came out, the children came out with their animals. They all came out with their clothes, dressed up in a very coarse manner, in a disheveled manner. And they began to beg Allah. Some narrations have mentioned for 40 days they consecutively. They begged Allah and begged Allah and begged Allah to uplift the punishment. When they thought they saw it coming. After this, this is the only nation that saw the punishment after which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Remove the punishment, it was uplifted. This is exclusive to the qawm, to the nation of Yunus alayhi salam. Insha'Allah tomorrow we will continue with part 12 of the Holy Qur'an.